Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for joining me in the Pastor Soapbox. You know, whenever Christians try too hard to relate to the world, and then we look like the world, we have nothing distinctive to offer. I think we should pause on, on that and meditate on it for a moment because it is true. One of the distinctions in James 1, for example, uh, when he says in verse 26 of James 1, if, if any man is religious but does not know how to bridle his own tongue, this man's religious is worthless. And then he says in verse 27 what true religion or the true Christian faith looks like in practice, and it is said, he says that pure religion undefiled is this, to visit the widows and the orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained or unspotted from the world. It's very similar to what the text of Scripture says in Romans, the 12th chapter. It says that we ought not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Scripture in Ephesians also encourages us to, to model, to put on the character that we do have, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should reflect this image of God, which is revealed through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So whenever we, we lose our identity in Christ, then we've lost something very unique and distinct, and that actually should be attractive to the world, and even though for some it may be repulsive. It is that they know that there is a difference. There is a distinct difference. There is something unique about us that they just do not have. Uh, now, the reason why I brought that up is that there is a, a civil war, maybe of terms or semantics or words, the use of words or the meaning of words. Let me just say this, though, that even when it comes to the scripture, we have the English translations, and the English translations, if they're faithful to the original language, are reliable. But in some translations that you, you can't necessarily convey the fullest of the, the original Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, and so sometimes it's good to, to look at references to say, okay, what are the, what's the, the sense here? What are the nuances here of that particular word? Because we, we always want to make sure that what it said in the original is what's translated in English, and a number of your translations, for example, I have the Legacy Standard Bible, which is an excellent translation, uh, so is um, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Bible, great translations. There are other translations that are helpful, and, and even the King James Version is a good one, but unfortunately, uh, it, it also is in need of, of hey, aid, and I know there's some who are KJV only, and they say, well, that's what Paul had, but that's not what Paul had. Uh, and the Latin Vulgate, which is the, the majority of how the, the King James Version was translated, is, is really not close to the original language of the scripture, the original language of the scripture. There were three, Hebrew, Aramaic, and uh, Greek, or Koine Greek. So the use of the Latin Vulgate was helpful, but today we, we have a, a plethora of uh, manuscripts and copies that we can uh, use and, 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 and uh, develop effective and more, I think, efficient translations closer to what was said during the time of the writing. So words are important. Words do matter. Words are significant. And over the years, certain words may change, like the word dope. You know, it was always a bad word for me, but now people use it and say, man, that, that singer is dope. Uh, yeah, well, I had to really change my mind because I saw so many people undope, and it wasn't a nice thing. It wasn't a pleasant sight. You know, those terms change over time, and now they use the word, uh, this person is based, which means, hey, this person's solid or accurate. <laughs> well, I didn't know that. And when I first heard him, like, he's based, what, what does it mean? So, you know, maybe I'm just a bit out of time, out of touch with the times. So words do change over the years. Now, so now let me get to my main argument. You say, well, you just seem to be going over the place. No, I'm going somewhere with this. Especially when it comes to uh, the music culture, the rap or hip-hop culture. Now, uh, some would argue that within that culture is a subculture, and, and, and that subculture is rooted in, in unbelief. That's, that's like the general thrust uh, of that particular industry. 
Uh, it points to an Illuminati, and the, the, it was there's like a, I think a book that's called the the Gospel According to Rap Music. And its objective was was just to permeate society in the world with unbelief, uh, with, with belief of maybe a higher power being self and not God. So rooted in that industry, historically, um, the objective was not good. The same could be said of, of rock music. Uh, rock and roll music's uh, beginning uh, was, was 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 drugs and morality. And so the beginnings of these industries were 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 not Good. They didn't have a goal. That says, "Hey, man, let's let's start a, a genre of music and let's man let's sing to the highest and glorify God to it." No, the agenda wasn't always a good one. So we we don't want to ignore the history of, of a particular a genesis of a, a, a specific music style of genre that's important. But over the years, as as young men and women came to saving faith and knowledge of the truth, they were. Adept or used to is a better word to, to rap music. And so they made a, an effort to utilize it or to redeem it for gospel. Now, let me just say that I'm not a rap music guy. I've listened to it over the years, off and on. I mean, I think I was around in the era where, where it first started. I still remember a, one rap song by a popular rap artist in New York. And I mean, it, it, the phrase was catchy and the guy was just poetically sound. And it was a clean rap. And a number of those artists in those times were relatively clean in, in what they said. Not all of them were. So it was a, a, a mixed bag. So I, I was in that era when it started to, to make its rise, like the late 80s, I think, maybe early 90s, uh, that, that it began to make its rise. And then uh, you have the NWA coming out of Compton, and, and then things became, began more, become more and more violent and gangster-related. And here it is, the extreme perversion of our young women. I cannot stress this enough. Of all the things that we would say, people of my ethnicity, oh, you know, the white man is doing this, and look at what the cops are doing. We have caused more harm to ourselves and our young ladies. The exploitation of them, very few, if any of them, are even dressed with modesty on some of these videos. You cannot watch them unless you want to drown in sinful lust. It is nothing but promoted and elevated pornography. It's called exploitation. It is, without question, a more severe form of slavery because it's somewhat voluntary, but other times it's forced. Like, you can't get to this place of prominence if you don't sell yourself so really it's called prostitution. And here we are in these communities where we're talking about all these issues and we're causing the most harm to each other. The way we treat women who should be treated with respect and dignity, but they seem to be objects of immoral sensuality. Let's, let's not go there, right, you say? Oh, but we must. We must. And I know there's some listening who says, well, you know, I don't, I'm not so-called, you know, in that community as far as being black. I'm not black either. But realize it's affected most people, indirectly or directly, because these songs are, are played and, and viewed by so many people of MTV, which to me is just, uh, uh, should be called mass transgression videos. Mass transgression videos this is what it is. Just the horror of these network channels and, and what uh, they will promote in the name of art. And it is not. It, it, is, it is depravity on sale. So what we find uh, through this industry, what we found, especially in those times with, with, with the gangs and the violence, that what came with it was immorality and drugs and death and this, this hardness, and this, this staunchness, this, this we will conquer you before you conquer us. And so you have all these black on black crimes that continue and just in alar on alarming rates. And I must say this as an aside that when our leaders say that white supremacy is the greatest threat, white supremacy is not the greatest threat. The stuff that they're making up. Uh, our greatest threat is our sins, but in that community, in those places like Chicago, we continue to annihilate each other. And very few organizations like the All Sharpens of the World are talking about it. 
These men do not care about lives. They care about money. They have no compassion, no love for those who are losing their lives because we have kids being shot, six years old, eight years old, 10 years old, in the line of fire, sleeping in their bedroom, and shots firing into their house, and the people shooting it don't even care. And yes, they're the same ethnicity. This is an atrocity. But I go back to the music industry. It, it did not create this, but it made it acceptable. Uh, it, it introduced uh, to our kids this, this hardness that it's okay to be hard. It's, it's okay to be violent. It's okay to be gangster. So now you have men now who were in that lifestyle. God brings them out of it. And they're like, well, you know, I mean, I have a gift, I have an ability. It's, it's in rap. But now I have theology with that. And now with that theology, I mix it with, with my artistry. And now I have rap music. Now they call it Christian rap. And we tend to do that. We, we, have, we call rock and roll Christian, Christian rock. And so we put Christian in front of it and all of a sudden it's sanctified. But I don't think that's helpful. I would say that Christians rap. But Christian rap is not a biblical category. But I am not going to say, hey, you should or shouldn't do it. I'm going to argue from the standpoint of neutrality right now because I'm trying to convey a point here. Because as soon as you say you're against something, like that, some people are like, but, 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 you ain't doing nothing to help nobody. What kind of music are you doing? What are you saying? What are you playing? You can't be judging folk who are using the gift of the Lord. All right, I give you that one. I'm not going to judge them. But what I'm trying to, to show is that with that particular genre comes baggage. Just as with all the other genres, rock and roll came with baggage too. This one comes with baggage. And if we don't see the baggage before we check on the plane, we bring it on with us, it becomes a very weighty baggage. And my argument to, to that is also that you see a lot of departures. A lot of artists in that industry, a number of them continue to abandon the faith for a reason. It's because that genre does come with baggage. And if you are not grounded in a local church, uh, that can weigh you down and discourage you and lead you to think that you no longer believe and you may not have been anyway. So it, it comes with, with that, accessorizing of things. And what we have noticed in, in the recent trends, the trending of this particular baggage the concept, it is that there's just this urge to import everything from the world into it. And I must commend um, one rapper, Lecrae, because he's been in the line of fire, and, and I would at least commend him for this. Uh, he does stand his ground, and you have to respect that. I appreciate his contributions in the past, and he's been a blessing to so many people in the past, so we don't want to just brush that off. But without question, he is, he is in a bit of a conflict with a number of people. I have a lot to say in that, and I, I hope I, I retain those thoughts and stay in the trajectory and get to the end. But there's a phrase called being righteous and ratchet. Um, and here's what's really tricky about what he said. Because in, in one sense, we are sinners and saints at the same time, right? We, we are justified, right? But we're justified sinners because the scripture says God justifies the ungodly. Now, when God sees us, he sees us robed in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ, and he calls us saints. We're saints by calling. We're not saints by nature, per se, but by calling. But within salvation, we're also given a new nature. But this new nature is for the spirit man. The old body of sin is still here. But with this new nature in the spirit man, there's also the power to subject the body to obey the words of Christ in holy living. So we want to understand the conflict, but there's a trickiness to this statement here, and listen to what Lecrae has said. He said that when it comes to saying we're righteous and ratchet, it says it's about understanding, and I quote, we are all nuanced individuals, not defined by our appearance or accepting of the imperfections we have. Near says, not defined by our appearance and accepting of the imperfections we have, but then he says, knowing our flawed expressions of individuality will not just be recognized or forgiven, but accepted by a creator. And that is simply not true. 
Now, he said, we're not defined by our appearance and accepting of the imperfections we have. Okay, that's not too bad, but that's a tricky statement. You'll have to elaborate. But this last one, knowing our flawed expressions of individuality will not just be recognized or forgiven, but accepted by a creator. And that's not true. God does not accept flawed expressions. And to say that he not only recognizes and forgives it, but accepts it, that once, it, both can't be true at the same time. If God forgives something, he can't accept it. I mean, the reason why he forgives it is because we acknowledge it was wrong and it was offensive to him. And it is a breach of not our union with Christ, but our communion with the triune God. Our union with Christ is always sealed by the Spirit of God eternally, but we don't enjoy the fellowship when sin is there. So that statement, knowing our flawed expressions of individuality will not just be recognized or forgiven, but accepted by a creator. Here it is, opens up the door to homosexuality, to polygamy, to all of the gross sins. Why? Because it's a broad, broad door that leads to destruction here. Because to say that God forgives me, then it's almost to say that God accepts me as I am, even though I don't want to change which I must make a very important insertion here, that God saves you as you are, but he never leaves you as you are. And God accepts you more, so not just as you are, but he accepts you in Christ. And in salvation, he will make you more like Christ. So he doesn't leave you in that state of rebellion or that immoral sin. If any man be in Christ, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he is a new creation. Behold, the old is gone and the new has come. That is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. So something uniquely happens in salvation. And in that work of salvation uh, it comes a change of mind concerning your sin and a change of mind and direction concerning Christ. You're running from the sin and running to Christ, leaving the sin, running to the cross, abandoning your sin, submitting to Christ on the cross for your salvation. So there's a change. Knowing our flawed expressions of individuality will not just be recognized or forgiven, but accepted by a creator. That's, this, is a, this is a very dangerous statement. It is misleading also. Because forgiveness is there without question, with our flawed expressions, but we're supposed to, as the scripture says, to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 10, when it speaks of what a spiritual battle looks like, although the context is Paul referencing the churches and his struggle with them, he gives us a, 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 like an insight into spiritual warfare. And, and he says that we bring everything into captivity to the big Christ. Every thought is brought into captivity. That includes our thought expressions. And then it is examined on the scripture, scrutinized by the word of God, and it is rejected in its totality if it doesn't represent the truth from the scripture. So to Lecrae's credit, I think he's endeavored to try to redeem what is redeemable and then reject what is not. But he talks about this. We are all nuanced individuals. And once more, if any man be in Christ, it doesn't say that he's a nuanced individual. He's a new creation in Christ. Now, the process of metamorphosis or change or transformation is progressive, but it is progressive nonetheless. And one of the things that happens is that you start to abandon the language of the world as well as the life of the world. So it's not only just your life in the sense of upright living, but your lips become more bibline, Christological, and rooted in the scripture than the world. So then you're telling the world, no, you need to adapt these truths. You need to change. We don't need to change to what you're doing. We're being changed and conformed to Christ by the scripture. So if you do enjoy listening to men like Lecrae, he's, he's been struggling a bit, I think, uh, to this final point, I need to say that, you know, I love brothers in Christ. I don't know all of them. Um, I design nothing but the best for them. I want them to succeed in the things that God has called them to do. 
I want them to have reward in heaven. The number of these men slowly began to drift from the local church and uh, reform doctrines or doctrines of grace because of the way they felt that they were being treated. And that came at the rise of the Ferguson uh, conflict in Missouri, which actually proved to be a lie. The things that they were saying, you know, hands up, don't shoot, that was a lie. When they said that uh, the, the young man uh, was not um, disobeying the cop's order, that's a lie. They found a fingerprint on the, the cop's gun. So the forensic evidence proved that this young man was actually robbing stores, but he was also resisting authority to the point where it was either him or the cop who would die. See, when the truth comes out, and we as men continue to perpetuate this truth, then there's something deeper going on. And I realize that America's history in slavery has not been the best story, but there's so much redemption in it. And for us to ever think that the government helping us is the best thing that we need, we do not need the government's help. And as one lady said in Harlem, we were doing fine without the government. It's not until the government came in with unreasonable aid, especially with welfare, that we became less empowered. Because once you tell a man that you will fish for him, his arms become limb. When you tell a man you will work for him, his feet become numb. And that's what happened. When you rob a man of his dignity, then he becomes like a beast. We find that in these neighborhoods. We don't need more government help. We need God's help. And we need God's help to restore a sense of dignity and manhood and strength and resolve and biblical love and biblical affection and most of all, a gospel sincerity back in these neighborhoods. So when we have these departures from sound churches because of what we think are ethnic issues, whether it was because of Trump and others, that's not why a number of you left those churches. You just needed a reason to leave the church. It's not the cause. Men's actions are never the cause of our decisions. And those things are always in our heart. So it was always there. Because we should bear up in these things and work through them. You say, well, these people were voting for Trump and they were trumping Trump all over the place and I couldn't take it anymore. Well, some churches are trumping Biden and Biden's policies continues to harm society, much less the perversion. I mean, look at the, the flags at the, at the White House. This, this was a gross display of brazen idolatry and sin before God himself. You looked up at Biden and says, God, look at Sodom and Gomorrah. I dare you to touch us. And some of you voted for him. No, these departures, the, the exodus, the, the fleeing from a sound biblical truth, means that we are emphasizing melanin, which is the least common factor in our body's genetics. What's more common in our humanity? We de-emphasize. What is less important? We idolize. That sounds like unbelief to me. So a lot of uh, these men and others, and I pray for Lecrae, and I'm not trying to be overjudgmental. My point is that some of the actions that these brothers are taking is that of unbelief, not true faith. And some have departed from the faith because of that. Now to my final point, and I, I will probably echo this several times in, in other podcasts because it's, it's critical. It's essential. It's indispensable. All right, enough of the big words. Please trace your stars, your Hollywood stars, your celebrities. Please do your soul a favor trace them to a local church. And if the end of the trace, you don't find a local church, and they're not affiliated with a local church, you know what's going on. It's the first John 2, 19 issue. Because even if they left one church, and you mean to tell me they can't find another Bible teaching church? That's a problem. Now, if they're attending Ebenezer Baptist in Atlanta, then you don't follow them because that, that, that man is acting in strict Violent unbelief for the pastor, the so-called pastor. Unbelief. Unbelief. He's acting like an unbeliever. You should trace these men that you respect, and even women, stars, or celebrities, to a local church. If they're not there, then this should not find you on their page. 
And I think to me that's like the hammer on top of the nail. That I find that as these men are drifting and these women are drifting, whether it be hip hop or other cultural driven styles that are accessories to Christianity that are not necessary for worship, that the more they drift, they tend to drift away from accentuating the thing, the entity, the people that Christ died for. As Peter says, he purchased the church with his blood. He didn't purchase rap music. He didn't purchase rock music. He didn't purchase jazz music. He purchased church with his blood. And if we make our culture, our melanin, our style, more important than the Savior who purchased the church with his blood, and we can't get through elections even though we may disagree, it means that we have made an idol out of melanin, which is a new Messiah, an idol out of music, which is a new God, and an idol really out of our own hearts, desires above Christ. So saints in Christ, I, I pray that you hear me out here. I'm making a plea with you. Avoid men and women who are not following Christ and submitted to leadership at a local church. If you cannot trace them to a Bible teaching, Christ exalting church, then they are worthy uh, to receive your unfollow. And find men and women who love the Lord Jesus Christ and his precious church, the bride. My name is Seymour Heligar. I am a slave of Christ with joy. I'm the husband of my lovely wife, a father, a grandfather, a love of Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ, and I just happen to pastor the church that Christ shepherded with his blood. Thank you so much. <laughs>